please welcome Yuval from Enganyama. Hi. Um, thanks, Alex. So um, the topic of my talk is uh, ZPU, the hardware path to verifiable everything. Okay, my mission uh, today is to convince you that there is a problem and that the solution is hardware. We will start by reinforcing that proving is complex, continue to show that hardware is necessary for uh, moving forwards, and conclude with some uh, architectural exploration of how we at Ingonyama envision that hardware. So uh, ZKP applications span two distinct groups, client side and server side. The two are quite different in many aspects. Client side is mostly concerned with uh, protecting one's uh, privacy and server side is mainly concerned with uh, trustless service providing. From an implementation perspective, client side is very power sensitive, while server side is also cost sensitive. We'll focus on the more imminent one, server side, and the reason that uh, we think server side is more imminent is because it is uh, essential to the scaling of blockchains. So when we think of ZPU, we think mostly server side. So verifiable everything is not a slogan. It's truly the holy grail of service providing. You may assume that providers want us to need to trust them, and that may have made sense once upon a time, but it's becoming less and less so. And the primary reason is that trust comes with liability. So as we know, ZKPs are small. They are sublinear, often constant, and this is very efficient for communication, for storage. Verification costs are also typically uh, low, but the problem is that proof generation is extremely complex. Representation costs are high as the arithmetization is an inflating process. The handling of mathematical structures such as polynomials, hashes, elliptical curves, and others um, are extremely expensive, and large finite fields are computationally unfriendly. So the common perception is that we have no problem. A survey on uh, Twitter, or X, asked, um, and this is I think ZK uh, validator survey, they asked two questions. What will be the highest growing segment for, this case, for, for ZK this year? And the answer was ZK for scaling. And I, I think that since we're talking about blockchain scaling, that makes sense. But when asked what, what does ZK need most to succeed, the forum answered more talent. And in fact, faster protocols came in last. To me, it's a little bit surprising. So perhaps there is no problem. Let's take a look at ZK EVM the prover used for EVM transaction evolution on Ethereum's L2. Currently, ZK rollups are latency limited, delaying transaction finality. Moreover, although they reduce transactional fees, they don't reduce them sufficiently for very small or very complex transactions. If you disagree, just ask yourselves, why does Ethereum not scale significantly yet? So how does one measure the efficiency of a ZKP implementation? Well, cost can be measured in power, improving time, in silicon area, data center area. Performance can be measured in security, and that's often the soundness of a proof. We can talk about the zero knowledge aspects or post quantum resistance. Finally, we want high performance at low cost. And we need to normalize that to the size of the problem. So if we choose security as the performance metric and power as the cost metric, then optimization is actually minimizing the power per security. So the obvious performance metric is security, but why choose power as the cost metric? The graph I plotted is a two-dimensional grid of time versus area. So actually, as you move up the vertical axis, you minimize time. And as you move uh, to the right on the horizontal axis, you minimize area. And 
as you can see, the, the idea is the time and area are interchangeable. For example, if we have a chip that performs 10 calculations in 10 seconds, we can use 10 of those chips to perform the same calculations in one second. This naive trade-offing is described by the dotted blue line. If the two operating points on the line edges are achievable, then any point on the line is also achievable. And that can be done simply by something we call time sharing. But what we would like to do, which is not trivial, is actually to improve both time and area concurrently. And that's the convex green line. Since power is approximately proportional to the product of time and area, minimizing power, power is equivalent to minimizing both time and area concurrently. So we can achieve our optimization goal by minimizing a single parameter power. So let's revisit the roll-up example to explain how power comes into play. To do this, we need to do a slight diversion to blockchain, first of all. So a blockchain is secure, and this is just one parameter of, of blockchain security. I'm not going to go th through all of them. Uh, when, so it's secure when singular consensus is maintained. So if, a net, if the network diverges into two different blockchain versions, security is lost. Maintaining this uh, singular consensus requires that the slowest participant <clears throat> receives the previous block before the next block is published. And this puts a limitation on block size and block rate. Mm. And subsequently, it makes the blockchain space scarce and it raises the price per transaction. And note that this is all related to the economics of blockchain. The running costs of blockchain, or the validator costs, also affect the price, but they actually put a lower bound on the cost per transaction. Now, rollups are used to alleviate the economic cost. Rollups can be viewed as a way to batch many L2 transactions into a single L1 transaction. To enjoy the L1 security level for a batch of L2 transactions, we package the L2 batch with a ZKP, with a zero knowledge proof, that is submitted to L1. The second column on the table right, shows a ZK rollup that submits a single proof per batch, while the third one shows aggregation of proofs. As you can see, the security cost per transaction is amortized over the total number of L2 transactions that were compressed into a single L1 transaction. The trouble is that proving costs incurred by the ZK rollup do not amortize over the transactions, but they rather accumulate. So this means that although blockchain economics are greatly improved by ZK rollups, the real transactional cost rises. Moreover, this cost varies, great, varies greatly with the complexity of the EVM transaction and is directly related to the power required to generate its proof. ZKP relies on many expensive mathematical primitives such as MSM, NTT, hashes, and more. Measuring the complexity of these primitives according to various metrics indicates why so much power is being utilized. So in this table, I marked in red the boxes where complexity cost is high. And the takeaway is that more than half of the box boxes are red. I'm going to be a little bit critical of us in this slide, but don't take anything personally. It's, it's a criticism about um, where I think our current efforts are being spent versus where they should be. And I stress that this is my opinion and it's based on my limited perspective. So the first problem is that we spend too much time and effort on abstraction. While abstraction, if done well, is very desirable for the developer, the developer is not the client. Other than that, abstraction often hides things. If implemented badly, abstraction hides complexity. In a way, it encourages non-transparency and over time, layers upon layers of abstraction create unnecessary complexity that is very hard to remove. Efficient software engineering is essentially a bottom-up process. And unfortunately, that's the opposite of abstraction. So while abstraction does have its virtues, it should never dominate over performance in places where efficiency is crucial. The second bullet is, I think, perhaps a misconception that security on its own sells. 
Okay, so while we all desire secure services, I would say that we would all be willing to forfeit security for discounted prices. Just ask yourselves if you would be willing to pay more commission to approve the security of a credit card transaction that you're doing. Now, there are niche applications where security is a must, but the market that we're aiming at is much larger. So what are ways to minimize power, power per security? So I claim that there are two and only two ways to achieve this. One is to improve the hardware, and two is to improve the algorithm. Improving the hardware can lower the power by using more efficient physical processes. Algorithms can lower the power by requiring less operations to achieve similar end results. So algorithms that uh, improve power usually develop over time. The evolution of such algorithms is aided by something we tend to call out-of-the-box thinking. But really all human thinking is limited to our uh, collective experiences. So when we think of out-of-the-box thinking, we just slightly stretch our generalization beyond linear. And this is why, in order to advance, we need to create new experiences. So the evolution of new algorithms depends on new hardware that enables new trial and error experiences. And this process is cyclic. Available hardware induces new algorithms, which in turn push to more advances in newer hardware. And this is the primary reason why hardware is a necessary part of the algorithmic development process. And let's examine two um, historical examples of this. The first is neural networks. And neural networks was uh, developed by McCulloch and Pitts in 1943. And advances were slow, and neural networks were actually considered an intractable method in machine learning. The neural network winter that arguably lasted until 2007 ended when GPUs finally arrived at the scene. And this kicked off um, the current era of exponential growth in DNNs. The visualization that I uh, gave in the, in the slide is actually a graph depicting the number of academic papers published in the neural network area as a function of time. And notice how the trend changes from linear to exponential right, ar right around 2007. Second example is of LDPC codes that dominate LTE standards. They actually dominate a lot of high data rate standards nowadays. So LDPC stands for Low Density Parity Check, and it's a family of iteratively decodable near capacity achieving error correcting codes. They were developed by Robert Gallagher in his 1963 PhD dissertation. And he actually says in his work that the codes are in impractical construction and they're only useful for information theoretical analysis. Now, the incredible growth in wireless connectivity experience from the late 80s triggered the need for better codes. And especially when uh, high data rate communication entered the scene in, uh, in the early 90s. In 1993, a new family of codes called Turbo Codes was introduced as a heuristic construction with iterative decoding that achieved rates close to capacity. And the silicon technology was advanced enough to implement these codes. They immediately entered wireless standards providing significantly better spectral utilization than was possible up until that point. And then it took another three years until the impractical LDPC codes were rediscovered and they were now sufficiently practical. And those codes are better than the Turbo codes for many reasons. Um, and none of this would have happened without the hardware being performant enough to make them practical. So there are three main types of off-the-shelf hardware platforms being used for ZKP today. Sorry. Uh, CPU doesn't parallelize well, but it's very easy to program. Code can quite easily be exported between uh, CPU platforms and 64-bit arithmetic is supported natively. GPU, conversely, is harder to program, but parallelizes very well. GPU code can also somewhat be exported across platforms and it supports only 32-bit arithmetics. FPGA is probably the most generic of the three, but it's also the most difficult to program. Code can be exported, but much of the lengthy compilation process must be repeated. FPGAs typically support fixed-point arithmetics much better than floating-point. Although some uh, differences exist, all of these hardware types are high in power to security for ZKP applications. 
As part of our mission in leading the ZKP infrastructure revolution, we are currently invested in Ingonyama in existing off-the-shelf hardware platforms. And we've actually got two front ends, iSQL and Blaze for GPU and FPGA. So how should we go about new hardware for ZKP? Let's start with what we consider not to do's. So this is a slide of, of certain things that we've seen or heard. Um, so first of all, we think that grids or farms of GPUs and FPGAs are not very constructive. They enable high proving throughputs, but they do not improve cost since their power remains unchanged. Um, we've also read about overly flexible ZKP ASICs, but in our opinion, they're inherently no different to GPUs. And we've read about very application-specific ZKP ASICs, but we think that they will not withstand the test of time, as they're too inflexible to, um, and, and they actually prevent exploration. So when building CPU, the ZKP ASIC, we would like to exploit things that we are in agreement at the same time as leaving room for exploring things that have not yet been settled. When examining hardware platforms on a performance versus flexibility grid, we argue that CPUs, GPUs, and FPGA are all very similar, and they're actually clustered on the bottom right. Um, they're all flexible in their general purpose hardwares, but they utilize high power. At the top left, we placed very application-specific solutions, suggested in various papers. And this cluster of solutions is very performant but very flexible. We envision ZPU to be of slightly higher power than the very customized solution, but much more flexible than them. And I will show you how this is possible. So first, let me show you how we think of the software hardware ecosystem at Ingonyama. Let's begin with the top application that typically runs on an OS. The application consists of tasks that are candidates for acceleration. Tasks for acceleration get routed to corresponding hardware accelerators via interfaces. We've made a distinction between API and TPI. TPI is task programming interface and it interfaces directly with a specific hardware. For example, iSQL and GPU. We think of the API layer as a unified interface between the OS and multiple TPIs. If we examine Ingonyama's ecosystem, we see that the unified API accesses distinct hardware platforms. We listed CPU as one of the platforms, primarily in order to note that a CPU can also act as a coprocessor. And anyone who's been following the advances in CPUs knows that. GPU and FPGA are currently our main go-to hardware platforms for acceleration, and hence iSQL in place. And in the future, we envision another TPI that will act as the interface to ZPU, allowing seamless integration with existing applications running over the unified API. So here's a partial list of what we think is important for ZPU architecture. The list is prioritized based on our experiences over the last two years. So we think first and foremost, we believe that ZPU must support large, large integer arithmetics natively. In existing hardware, this is probably the most power consuming atomic mechanism. For example, think of how many computations and data movements need to happen in both GPU and FPGA to achieve a single 256 bit modular multiplier. Why worry about carry logic and Karatsuba and why settle for Montgomery and transformations? Secondly, since ZKP is based on polynomials, polynomial manipulation is elementary, hence the need for NTT. Supporting a basic 2 by 2 Kulituki butterfly natively is invaluable. Since arithmetics are based on large integer fields, wide buses, large L1 memories and high IO bandwidths are favorable. Since individual ALU cores are larger, now that they support wide integer arithmetics natively, like we said, a fewer of them suffice. And then we can actually use MIMD vector processing. It becomes realizable rather than SIMD, which is what we've got now. Large constant memories are an advantage for supporting large setups. And finally, we do believe that a lot of stuff that works for GPU 
should be inherited by Zapier. The top level architecture, and this is just what we think now, right? Um, so multi-core SOC comprising of multiprocessors. Before we dive into the multiprocessor architecture, know that we are strong believers in the SOC concept. Whether ZPU is used as the main chip in the system or as a coprocessor, we think a non-chip CPU is desirable, allowing management tasks to remain internal. Global memory is a dedicated CPU memory, it's DDR or HBM, with possible external mapping via CXL. The global memory management unit, potentially consisting of L2 caching mechanisms, and global interconnect allows fast, low power switching between MPs. Go down and level to the MP. The MP encapsulates a group of processing elements. Each MP has dedicated interconnect, an MMU that potentially consists of an L1 caching mechanism. The interconnect is a low power, full width multiplexer, allowing any deterministic data remapping between PEs. The MP is a MIMD processor, allowing PEs to perform different instructions simultaneously. This is a significant differentiator from existing hardware. An MP is capable of performing self-contained sub-programs solely on its own. The lowest level hierarchy, and perhaps the most interesting, is the PE. Each PE is a 2x2 two two Cooley Tukey accumulator. We call it CTA. Its biggest single clock instruction performs a 2x2 two two finite field Cooley Tukey butterfly, including accumulation of the CT, CT outputs to accumulation registers. All other instructions are subsets of the CTA. Note that since the PE has three inputs and two outputs, it is capable of performing two operations concurrently. For example, it can accumulate the left input in the left accumulator while performing a MAC operation over the right two. The PE has short interconnect routes for relaying its outputs directly to its inputs for very low latency feedback. The PE can execute small self-contained subprograms limited to its memory size. Note that the PE is completely deterministic and does not utilize caching. Finally, the PE supports single clock operations at a native width of 384 bits, but this can be partitioned in a SIMD way, for example, to six 64-bit um, operations concurrently. Let me show you a simple analysis, and we'll end with this of how ZPU efficiency can improve upon currently available hardware. Take, for example, NVIDIA's 3090Ti. It's a 628 millimeter square chip. The process is 8 nanometer, and it runs on a 450 watt supply, including active cooling. The 3090 has approximately 10 tera operations per second, considering an operation to be a 32-bit integer multiplication. Now, using the 3090 to perform a single 377-bit modular multiplication for BLS 12 377, 377 requires splitting this, you know, the, the 377 bits to 12 digits. And using Montgomery's transformation, this requires approximately 5 times 12 squared operations per each single modular multiplication. Now, both analytical analysis and measurements on ICICL and complete competing platforms resulted in one gigamult of, of these multiplications per second for approximately 30 watts of power. Now, what we did is we used something called OpenRoad, which is an open source synthesizer and place and route tool with a 7 nanometer package called ASAP7. And we were able to construct the same 377-bit fully pipelined multiplier running at 500 megasamples per second. The multiplier is a Barrett multiplier. It's based on Karatsuba, and it's based on our current uh, Xilinx Ultra Scale Plus design without any special customization. I mean, this took really like a few hours, most of them just the, the synthesis. Um, now, without any optimization or tuning, we were able to build the same multiplier, achieving one giga multiplications mm. for only two watts. That's a times 15. 
And additionally, the area, the area required for the multiplier was a mere 0.23 millimeters squared. We estimate that customization and tuning can result in more than 100x improvement in power to the current GPU. Now, if we take the power to 4 watts and the area to 1 millimeter squared, just to account for extra circuitry which exists, we can get 110 giga multiplications per second on the same 450 watts power for less than 20% the area of the 3090. Now, the power dissipation would, of course, be very challenging, potentially impossible, and we'd probably not opt for such a, a, a large chip, but we would go for something much smaller. But this is just to give you some idea of how much can be improved just by customizing the basic multiplier building block. Okay, so I'll just summarize and then I'll take some questions. Um, I guess I try to reinforce that proving is computationally hard um, and it's economically preventing ZKP widespread use. I showed that complexity can be improved by uh, hardware and algorithms. And finally, I presented some of our thoughts on the ZPU hardware and how it potentially is at least 100 times more efficient than existing solutions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Yuval. Um, we're going to open it up to questions, and I'll bring the mic to whoever has a question. Does anyone have a... Oh, you have a mic over there. Okay. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a question? We've got about five minutes before we've got to go to the next one. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, for sort of the speed of advances in algorithms and, and schemes, how do you guys decide on Yama and on what properties of half acceleration to sort of focus on in particular? Again? How do we decide what? What properties to focus on? Because like each algorithm or scheme could have specific things that could speed up the right. improving of Right. Them. So I guess it's a little bit of uh, like risk mitigation, right? You want to get as customized as you can, but you want to keep it open so that it's usable for as many things as possible. Um, so. We're basing it on our experience, and we are still not sure that the timing is right, right. So this is what we think now, but I think that when we actually start building ZPU, things will potentially change. Um, this is the picture that, that we're experiencing right now. Right? Uh, any more questions from the audience? Okay, cool. I actually have one question, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, take advantage of my of my mic here. Um, so the a couple of concrete examples you gave were around multiscalar multiplication, and I think you mentioned NTT too. Um, how do you all consider you know the other steps in generating an end to end proof such as circuit synthesis and witness generation, um, and how does the architecture you described uh, support you know? A variety of different types of potential circuits that you'd want to generate in a, I guess, by the virtue of it being a ZPU, it could support multiple kind of back end proving systems. Yeah, so um, I, I guess we consider uh, circuit synthesis um, perhaps as, as an offline process. Um, so we don't uh, actually at this time have any uh, special uh, hardware for it. But I guess for certain proving systems, maybe that is not true. Um, and, and maybe it's something to uh, look into. Amazing. Thank you very much. This is a great presentation. Let's give Yuval a round of applause. Thank you.